So, as a user of CPAN, this is kind of like the idealized view. Um, you have a, and, and kind of almost how it's evangelized. You have a problem, you go to CPAN, you find the module, um, you download it, it does exactly what you want, it's well documented. If you went to Tom's talk recently, the previous talk, you've heard some of the things you can do to address perhaps some of these gaps. It has a large test suite, it's stable, it's actively supported, and it plays nicely with um, other CPAN modules. Back in the real world, um, so I was looking for a module to generate random passwords and figured, well, there, there must be, someone must have done this. Um, in true Perl style, I almost thought, I'll just write it myself, that'll be quicker almost than going finding it on CPAN, but resisted that temptation. Found five modules um, and picked one that looked like that's obviously the right candidate. Lots of documentation, it's based on a FIPS standard. Yeah, it just seems to do exactly what I want. Um, but it turns out to have an serious <laughs> bug. Uh, works completely fine, apart from every now and then, it'll just spin in a, an infinite loop. Um, not so good if you're running this on the back end of a web server. Um, and it turns out that I've been reported a number of times by other people, been there for a while, um, uh, and I had a look at the code and thought, I'm not going to fix that anytime soon. So then went back and thought, okay, well, let's go and look at these other modules. So I did a bit more digging and found eight modules. I thought, okay, well, I really have no clue which is the right module for me to use here. So I'll review them all, and then I'll post that review, because if I've hit this same issue, I'm sure other people have. Um, so wrote the review, posted it. Straight away, um, Gabor posted saying, ha, you've missed this module, which prompted me to do a bit more searching and find another three modules. Um, so these are the... 12 uh, password modules, and you can see they're basically split into two groups. There's ones um, which are for basically generating random character strings as passwords, and ones for generating pronounceable ones that look like words but actually are dictionary words. Um, some of the ones down here try to not generate dictionary words but actually do. Um, and after reviewing them, it turned out that unfortunately, Neither of the modules which kind of provides both turns out to be the best module as a result of all the different bits of testing that I did. Um, and you can see there's lots of different features that you might want where, to, where you think, actually, I like that feature with this module, but actually this one is more reliable and doesn't have any um, infinite loops, etc. So I'm just going to describe what my current process is. At the moment, this evolves every time I do a new review. Um, I'd be interested in hearing if there's something you think I'm missing. So first, I'll, I'll pick some topic. At the moment, my rule is, if I look for a module because I want to use it in my work and I find more than one, then I have to put it on my backlog for doing a review. Um, so find all suitable modules um, using various things. Uh, Google, search uh, .cpan.org, meta-cpan, and other things. Um, I have a standard format now structure for the reviews. The first piece is an introduction, includes in particular a table with information about the module, who the author is, the current version, the last time it was released. That's automatically built by going and querying meta CPAN. Then there's a section for each module. Um, uh, all these different pieces are built together using the template tools. The section for each module, I write a standard, I take a, come up with some standard example program which I then port to each module and I use um, template toolkit filters to pull in the relevant bits of the code, but then also to run the code and include the output, so it, it always is, this is from running this code. Whereas if you look, look at a lot of Perl modules, you think, no, that output didn't come from that code, because that code doesn't work. Um, uh, I then do a number of comparisons, um, I'll talk about that. Those are then conclusions with recommendations of which modules to use um, in, uh, in what situation. So for comparisons, I generally do at least a performance comparison um, using uh, benchmark um, coverage tests. These are the things that usually take up the most amount of my time since it usually involves um, going and building a corpus of test data and you'll see some examples where actually that was critical in comparing them. And it was only in doing the coverage testing that it became obvious which was the right module to use or more often which is the module to really avoid. Um, and possibly others. So when I did the, the, the user agent review, someone's uh, commented saying, it'd be good to know what the coverage is for robot identification. 
So, okay, go and build it, find another corpus, add that test, etc. Uh, you mentioned coverage. What kind of coverage do you mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, what kind of coverage do you mean exactly? Like, um, coverage, that, test coverage? Like... That'll probably be clearer on the next oh, okay. slide. Oh, no. If it isn't, ask me again. Um, and so as I go along, so I'm reviewing these modules, and generally that involves me looking at the code to work out things that I couldn't work out from the documentation. And so on all of these, I've been submitting, part another one of my rules is that if I find some problem, I've got to submit a bug. If the documentation wasn't clear, I've got to submit documentation. And that actually, quite a lot of the time is on that. Um, so these are the reviews I've done so far. Uh, generating passwords, 12 modules. Three to five of them actively maintained, and you saw on the previous slide. There's two which are kind of the best ones to use, but in certain situations you might want to use others. Um, I then did looking at the location of an IP address. Um, so there are 11 modules, five of them actively maintained. So that's one example for coverage testing. where So the, the core test was um, how accurately do they come up with um, the right country for the IP address? Part of the problem is it's hard to determine what really is the, the right country for them. Um, but so basically I worked at a suite where I went and found some data that was online where people said, essentially identified this IP address is in this country. Um, so and basically go beyond the existing test suite and actually test this material world. Yes. Okay. Lots of modules have been tested perhaps with a small amount of coverage. Okay. And so basically say, well, no. Another good example is user agent streams. Quite a lot of them have been tested with just standard browsers. Um, I went and found a corpus of, kind of every um, user agent stream I could find online and ran them all past those. And the coverage goes anywhere between 7% and 40%. So most of them don't cover at least even half of the things that are out there. Um, uh, I've also just recently found another module that I need to add to that, that uh, coverage. So the other thing, the other, another rule I've got is that whenever I do a review, I've got to keep that up to date. So I've written a tool that monitors all the modules that I've reviewed and lets me know when there's a new version out. Um, uh, spelling out numbers in English, um, there are only four of these modules, but actually that one took an awful long time. So I ended up writing code to run all the modules in, par in, in parallel and where there were differences, try and work out what those differences were and build up a table so I could identify bugs kind of automatically, particularly in the, the real high numbers. Um, just last night, I've been granted um, co-maintainer on the module that came out in top. I found a few bugs, but it been, hasn't been touched for about the last five years, and so I've been working through the process on taking over that module. Um, and most recently, parsing user agent strings. Um, uh, and Slightly bizarrely, I'm adopting a module here basically to tell people not to use it so I can update your documentation to say, <laughs> don't use this module, use some other modules, and to point to the review and point and say, in this situation, use this module, in that situation, use this other module. Um, uh, of all of the modules, this is the one that's just calling out for uh, the people who are actively maintaining modules to work together because the big effort in one of these modules is. Um, going and finding all the different user agent strings and when Firefox does a new release today, um, making sure that your, the module uh, covers those. So it's actually an awful lot of grunt work uh, on writing the rules and testing the coverage. Um, so that's kind of another little side project to try and encourage um, them. I had a really strong temptation on writing this review, which I get on every review, to write my own module, having kind of <laughs> learned, learned lots of things from all these other modules, then go, ah, now I can see what I think the perfect module uh, would be. But given there's 12 modules in some of these categories, I have kind of think I should resist that temptation. Um, so, then uh, some observations. So, so the first thing is, it's hard to find all the modules. So if you've got a given problem and you want a module to help you, it's actually really hard. I've put an awful lot of effort into finding password modules. I still missed four. Um, uh, the the one-line summary that people is set in the name uh, section for modules is quite often not helpful. So if, if you're searching, it won't be clear that this module actually is relevant to you. So one of the ones for passwords just says, an alternative to using DevRandom. 
which, okay, is strictly true, doesn't really get across everything the module could do. Um, Does that not often reveal what the module was when the person first thought of it? Yeah, and true. it's grown for five years since. And yeah, yes. It says it's a knife, but in fact it's a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> yes. And, and yeah. some of them will say, so one module that I saw recently said, um, a poem module for Cairo. And I thought, is this an Egyptian module? <laughs> So, purely from curiosity, went and found out what it was. Ah, so it's a 2D uh, vector graphics library. I mailed the maintainer saying, this might seem really anal, but how about changing your uh, the one-liner to be this, because that'll make it really obvious what it is. Um, and module pages often don't present well in search engines. So if you go to Google and do a search, you might come up with something like this, which tells you absolutely nothing about what the module is. You might be able to guess from the IP country bit, um, but with some modules, even that's not obvious. Particularly where there's lots of authors competing in for the, roughly the same module um, concept. Once the namespace has been taken by the first few people there, people have to start getting creative on the names. Um, so some more observations. Volume of documentation is not always a good indicator. So the, that crypt ran password has lots of documentation. Turn out you should never use it. Um, HTTP detect user agent has kind of this much documentation. Basically, these are the methods, and hopefully it's obvious what you should use it for. Um, turns out it's got very really good performance. Came out best on performance and second on coverage. So actually, it's a pretty good module to use. Um, there's a, a wide spread of code quality Perl generations. You know, so the module hasn't been touched since 2003. Lots of recent um, standard behaviours that won't be seen in there. Um, uh, the module pod rarely puts the module in context, kind of follows on from your point that but when someone's writing a module, they're solving their, the problem they had um, at the time and not thinking, where does this fit into the bigger picture? But as a result, that makes it harder for someone else to try to use it slightly beyond its original context. Um, version number isn't always an accurate indicator. Uh, a graph to kind of almost illustrate something related to that. Um, some of the really good modules I've ended up recommending have version 0.02. Other mo modules have version 2. Point something or other, and actually they're not the ones you should do. So it's, it's tempting to think version number is a good indicator, but it isn't always. There's lots of, in doing this, I've been coming across lots of different Perl sites and I'm kind of searching for information. And there's lots of Perl sites that I seem to discover one every week, but they're, they're not very well kind of interlinked. There's not one place you can go and from there find all the information. Meta CPAN is becoming, um, if you like, becoming that site. I've been having quite a lot of email over the last two weeks with uh, Olaf Alders from uh, the Meta CPAN project. Um, uh, and many modules don't gracefully handle invalid input. This is the thing I tend to find when I'm doing the coverage testing and testing with as big a data set as I can come across. Um, so. There are some modules that just don't work. There's one module I came across that there's no way it works. It's got a serious kind of error. Um, yet, you might spend time finding it, and then you first start running it, as I did, and thinking, I must be doing something stupid here. Um, uh, module authors aren't encouraged to cooperate. Um, I don't think there's a mechanism that encourages people working on complementary modules to work together. Um, uh, and some people might not want to, but there's no kind of cultural imperative for people to do this, or cultural support to, to help people do it. Um, it's often hard to make changes and, and to contribute. Um, as I'm going along, I quite often am finding just little bugs or little documentation tweaks and firing them off or submitting them to RT. Um, there's quite a long process to, to getting these things into modules. How many of the modules you're finding you have, basically, I I always used to have that issue until people started switching over to GitHub. But it, I, is it that you're mostly coming across modules that are kind of pre-Git and GitHub? Or do, have you found that with modules that have GitHub, you get a faster response? Or um, probably on average, somewhat yes. Um, so it is one indicator that this is probably more recently maintained, perhaps better maintained. The maintainer might be bit more open to yes, I can take your submission, etc. Uh, I've got the opposite. Um, I actually retire my modules to GitHub. So ah. if I don't want it, I don't want it to litter CPAN, 
I've started taking them off and putting them, they're still on back pan, but I put them on GitHub so that the code isn't lost. Excellent. I've got a slide for you later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two minutes left. I've got two minutes left. No, 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 I've been going 15 minutes, 5 minutes. Sorry, yes. <laughs> oh, I need to talk a bit quicker then. Um, and um, lots of modules, I think, stop evolving once the author's needs are met. So someone's got a need, they write a module, they upload it to CPAN, and think, great, I'm done, it does what I need, I'll move on. This just shows the distribution of version them, the distribution of distribution version numbers. So the most common version number for a distribution is 0.01, <laughs> and the next one is 0.02 and 0.03. And so just up to 0.05 or 0.06 represents nearly a third of the distributions on CPAN. Um, so some thoughts for very quickly for improving. Uh, so this is basically saying we need some mechanism for generating lots of modules is a good idea, but I think but CPAN needs some way to kind of try and converge things down and take the best from various modules and put them together. Um, the first proposal is the ability to tag a module as being part of a group. So then CPAN search, when you return it, can say, well, actually, this is a member of this group and a member of that group. So it just makes it a lot easier for someone to discover um, uh, a module. Um, then the ability to associate a review with a, a module group. So essentially, perhaps through pause, basically provide a URI and associate it with a module group. Uh, the ability to register use of a module, say, I am using this module. And if that's then managed centrally, then you can see which of the modules get lots of use, and is my module actually not getting used at all, so maybe I can uh, retire it. It helps module authors know how many people are using different versions of their module. You could all, we could also add the ability to follow a module. So I've been following lots of modules and using one from each review, the one that I picked as the, one, the best one for me to use for my need. Uh, Semantic versioning is, there's a kind of a, a manifesto posted on semver.org by one of the co-creators of GitHub that basically just says, let's have some standard interpretation of uh, the bits that make up a version, and in particular, what, mean, what does version 0 point something mean compared to anything after 0? Um, lots of these are, are kind of what's followed with, with CPAN and how people use their version numbers, but not quite. So, um, uh, Olaf um, from GitHub, no, not GitHub, Meta CPAN, suggested, well, maybe we just have a tag you can put in the metadata that says, I am following semantic versioning, which then would let you identify, okay, this is a version naught, so that means the API is likely to change, whereas actually lots of version naughts are stable, finished, they're not going to change. Um, if you're familiar with LinkedIn, it's got a mechanism for, say, complete your profile to encourage you to, these are the steps to do as a, as a a born-again CPAN contributor, it would be really nice if there was a, these are the modern things to do to a, a module to uh, behave well on CPAN and to help out other users. And I'm finding it very hard to work out what all of those things are, um, which well, I'm guessing perhaps some others do as well. Um, and maybe that's something that CPAN would calculate for a module. The, there is the, the quality um, thing that's still going. Yes. Oh, yeah. quality, quality, quality. quality. Yeah. yes. Thank you. Um, just some thoughts on making modules appear better in search engines, and in particular, either having a, another section in pod or the, a convention that the first paragraph of the description get used as the, the meta name abstract, so that search engines would then provide useful um, information as a summary. And similarly, kind of some conventions for how to how to write the one-line summary for a module so that it does then appear better in search engines, etc. since that's how most people are finding modules. I'll skip over this one. It ended up being discussed on a, on a main list and lots of people said, man, I'm just wrong. <laughs> um, but it did lead to some other interesting ideas. Your slide. Um, so, in a, a talk earlier today, Stephen, Stephen Little said, ha, huh, it's... It didn't necessarily say it was great, but in Perl we never throw anything away, and that's part of the problem with CPAN, is nothing, well, things very rarely get thrown away. Um, it would be good if there was some mechanism where modules could be retired, so people aren't finding them and spending time on um, evaluating whether that's the right module for them to use. But it needs to be a careful process. You know, someone put some effort 
and, and potentially some love to release it at some point in the past. So there's the, um, the CPAN guidelines, if you have to respect something on CPAN that someone else has done. Um, what next? Um, so work on various ways to get some of these ideas implemented. As I said, I'm already discussing with uh, Olaf from Meta CPAN and I've been having email with uh, Andreas Koenig from, uh, from PAUSE. Um, I'm going to move the, the reviews away from uh, blogs.pil.org because it's just too painful trying to write these big articles in a, in a blog engine. Um, update the first two reviews I've done with uh, the tools I've got to make them easier to keep up to date. Um, someone suggested that I announce that I'm, I'm working on a review in this area so people can suggest modules and say, hey, what about doing this in your coverage tests, etc. <clears throat> start doing some SEO and pimping. Quite often when you Google, you find pages that aren't about modules saying, here's a good way, for example, to generate passwords in Perl. And actually, that page would say, but this is just a simple example. The, the best thing to do is to go and use one of these modules. Um, and some more reviews and potentially you find some people to, if anyone else has a, a strange compulsion to, to join this hobby. So these people um, helped review this and gave me comments, etc., on the ideas in this. Yeah. Um, so, so thinking, thinking about this thing you're doing, kind of the, the natural way to take this forward. I mean, you need to be able to crowdsource this. Yeah. Um, so, so you need all the three people to be able to do a set of reviews for a set of modules and publish it in some way and have some central place to, to I'm thinking of those. putting these all onto GitHub so that because there's a load of source code and things to build the article. That's that's totally one way to do it. You, the thing that I'm thinking of is to publish them as kind of a micro format. So you could deploy you know within HTML formats with with you know just spams and classes for yeah. how you're going to write a review. And then you could tell Meta CPAN or whatever, I'm a false contributor and it can authenticate with that. And my review site is here. And yep. once you have a standard link format, and once all your reviews are in a standard format, yep. it can then suck them up and ingest them with data. The HTML uh, with the classes and span, etc., was what I was planning to do so that I could have standard CSS to make these things look better than they do currently. Yep. Um, but yeah. If you could send me some email, because I'll probably forget all the, the good things you just said. Um, okay. Thank you. And, and, but, sorry, I've got two points. One of them, when you when you made the point that we don't we don't encourage people to cooperate, um, that I guess the face that people see for modules has been searched on CPAN, and that's that's absolutely true, because it is like that. Um, there are certain big islands within the community where if you go and talk to anybody about anything, then, then A, you'll get suggestions and recommendations, uh, and B, you'll probably get to commit this, uh, and you told that one line doc patch, well, you're shipping it as well. Yes, <laughs> um, true. I should have made clear at the start, in a way, I kind of see this as relating to the long tail. There are some really excellent modules, well maintained, where the maintainers respond. It's the kind of uh, for the 80-20 rule. It's the eighty CPAN. It's the eighty percent that kind of falls into this category, I think, and the twenty percent of the, the fantastic modules and distributions. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I uh, there's a question there, and there one I've been working with Python quite a lot. Their packaging is next terrible. question. <laughs> <laughs> and they're they're they're, 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 they're we are overrunning a lot. Okay. Um, there's not another talk here. Yeah. There's not a lot of talk in here, but that's where. If you want to leave, feel free to leave. Sorry. Well, very few with Python notes, it's very standard to be able to put a Git repository into your requirements. So instead of saying, I need uh, you know, Foobar version 1, you say, I need Foobar from this Git repository, which would be the one you just bought, did for corrections to, and are using live in production until the author can get around to the patches back. And just from a working point of view, Suddenly having broken code is an issue because it's broken code you just fixed and are using without it getting it, it's not in the way of your deploy process at all. So if mini CPAN or whatever, make file could accept git um, or source links URLs. Suddenly that style of working becomes much easier. Can you email me a pointer? Okay, so um, I'm Neil B at cpan.org. Um, okay.
I will. Thank you.